pleasure and an honor to be here uh, among so many of you. Um, I am not traditionally learned, so that makes the privilege and honor greater for me. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless and reward the heirs of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I ask all of you to make dua for me especially. Um, the topic under consideration today is understanding contemporary atheism through scientism. Now, a little bit of a background on me. Uh, I did study Western philosophy and Islamic philosophy under Sayyid Naqib al -Atas. And one of the primary concerns that I had during my studies was the topic of contemporary atheism. Um, and it was also the subject of my master's thesis. And one of the things that I noticed uh, that was problematic in all of the responses regarding atheism, especially from the Christian perspective, was the fact that they were not addressing the elephant in the room. Yeah, let's see. And um, the elephant in the room is with regard to the history of scientism, where it comes from, and why, in fact, many contemporary atheists adopt it as the primary methodology and approach towards their, with, with regard to their skepticism. So the importance of this topic there are various reasons why this topic is important. First off, scientism is the primary means by which contemporary atheists justify their skepticism. And we cannot counter contemporary atheism without first understanding their idealization of science. Furthermore, as I've already clued in, my simply, by simply reviewing the intellectual history behind scientism, we already know the solution. And to give you a bit of a hint here, from the philosopher George Santayana, those who not do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And indeed, the contemporary atheists have not recalled their own past, have not recalled the past of their particular ideology, the particular methodology that they utilize in order to justify their skepticism. And by understanding that past, we can find a very simple solution. Because believe it or not, the Western tradition itself has already refuted it. Um, unfortunately, though, many individuals are not aware of this. So first off, I want to go over briefly what is contemporary atheism. Now, I know many of you have already gone through several presentations where the definition of atheism was mentioned. However, I just want to briefly summarize and give you a, an understanding of how contemporary atheists see themselves. Okay. So atheism has traditionally been defined as the belief that God does not exist. The belief that God does not exist this is a positive claim, a claim of something's non-existence. Right, so they have knowledge that something doesn't exist. This is what they're claiming, okay? However, since the 20th century, atheist philosophers have differentiated between two categories of atheism. They have, in fact, demarcated between two types of atheism, and one in which they currently adopt more than the other. And without realizing this, we can make a number of mistakes. So the categorization goes as so. The first being negative atheism, also referred to as weak atheism. And by the way, we're going to discuss how this uh, categorization occurred and who came up with it at a later point. However, in the meantime, I just want to summarize this. The first is negative atheism or weak atheism, and that is the position or the lack of belief that God or gods exist. The lack of belief, either a lack of awareness or the position that one does not know. Okay. And of course, this is uh, previously known as agnosticism. However, atheists have co-opted the definition and claimed it for themselves. So examples of this are there isn't enough evidence or theism is irrational because there is not enough evidence or enough justification. Right? And the more common definition that we're used to, the traditional one, is what we call now positive atheism or strong atheism. And that is the position, the belief that God or gods do not exist. There is no God. Okay? Now, some of you are probably wondering, what's the difference? <laughs> because it is quite subtle. Uh, the difference between negative and positive atheism is subtle, but significant in understanding the arguments of contemporary atheists. Why? Contemporary atheists are more concerned with justifying belief rather than proving the existence of God per se. In other words, they're more concerned with questions like, what is good evidence? What is evidence? what is considered rational, okay? Likewise, contemporary atheists require only the theist to provide justification for belief, 
In other words, the former believe they don't need to justify their position because they assume they don't have one. Most contemporary atheists today believe they do not have to justify their skepticism to the theist. It is our job to prove to them that we are rational and that theism is rational. They just have to sit back and let us do all the work. That is their claim. That is their so-called position. However, there are hidden beliefs and assumptions in their approach which are beliefs about evidence and rationality. These must be challenged in order to refute contemporary atheist thought. And what are those hidden assumptions about evidence and rationality? And that's where we come to scientism. Contemporary atheists follow an epistemology, otherwise known as theory of knowledge, known as evidentialism. Evidence is necessary to justify a belief. That is their main position. Evidence is necessary to justify beliefs in all cases. Okay? However, they follow a very specific form. They adhere to a specific form of ev evidentialism known as scientism, which is the belief that science is the best and only means to know anything. Again, the belief that science is the best and only means to know anything. Now, for those who are uh, learned on the subject, and very clever, you'll notice that there is a problem with these two statements, but we'll get to that later. Okay. So let's discuss the history of this ideology. And I first want to start with a, a uh, dapper British gentleman by the name of uh, Bertrand Russell. Okay. He was an atheist philosopher of the 20th century. And during his period of time, during his life, most philosophers in the analytical school of philosophy believed that numbers were real things, like objects. <laughs> now you know why I, I left the field. Um, aside from thinking long, deep thoughts about unemployment, but that's a different issue. Um, so during his period of time, uh, many philosophers believed that numbers existed actually in some other realm because they were useful, they could, they could actually they cohered with reality. They actually believed that these things were real in some idealistic realm, okay? Like Neoplatonic realm. Now, he didn't like this idea. In fact, he thought it was ridiculous, alhamdulillah, right? And he uh, wrote a very uh, interesting thesis on this subject with his friend Whitehead called the Principia Mathematica. And he actually proved that all mathematics could be reduced to logic. Okay? All mathematics, all mathematical principles could be reduced to logical axioms, or at least the vast majority of them. Now, before going into how this influences uh, contemporary scientism, I will say that this also provided positive benefits for society in that he is considered the father of contemporary uh, computer science. In fact, programmers consider him to be the father of their field because he was able to reduce mathematics to symbolic relationships. Okay? Something to note. However, he did something also in the negative sense. Uh, he influenced philosophy in a negative way, uh, accidentally, because once many philosophers agreed with him that numbers were just symbols, they were analytic and not synthetic. Let me explain that real quick as well. Analytical statements are true by definition. Synthetic statements are true by virtue of your experience. So for example, the grass is green outside is a synthetic statement because I have to empirically verify the grass in order to make that statement meaningful, okay? Whereas a statement, um, a bachelor is a single person, is true by definition, right? All right. So he proved that mathematics were analytic, all right? And as a result of that, many philosophers at the time started to think, well, if numbers are analytic, then what about other things in that realm that we thought numbers existed in? For example, God. Maybe the concept, maybe the statement God exists is an analytic statement. Maybe that's not a synthetic one. So he accidentally started this idea that perhaps the concept of God is itself a meaningless construct. It does not have any content outside of itself. So then we get to this eccentric individual by the name of Ludwig Wittgenstein, and uh, 
he was a very interesting fellow in that uh, he believed, quite arrogantly, that he had resolved all the problems of philosophy after writing a pamphlet. And then he went to become a teacher in grammar school. Um, but he's also very brilliant in that he caused probably one of the greatest problems in philosophy that we are currently dealing with today. He was the first to really propose an explicit form of scientism. So he actually studied under Russell for a brief period of time, and he read the Principia Mathematica. And he thought to himself, you know, let me see if I can apply this to everything else around me. Let me see if I can come up with a principle, or, an, or at least a sort of scaffolding, a construct, that can differentiate between a meaningful statement and, a, and one that is not meaningful. Okay. And so he stated in his Tractatus the following. The right method of philosophy would be this, to say nothing except what can be said, i.e. the propositions of natural science, something that has nothing to do with philosophy, and then always when someone else wished to say something metaphysical or otherworldly, like example, God, to demonstrate to him that he had given no meaning to certain signs in his propositions. So he gave this idea that basically there's no meaning to a statement unless you can provide scientific justification, okay? Now, a group of philosophers known as the Vienna Circle were really inspired by this little work of his. And they are called the Vienna Circle because they used to meet at the University of Vienna. And there was a number of them. I'm not gonna go through each person. Uh, A.J. Ayer is probably the most famous of them though. And they came up with what we call the verification principle. Now, I, want to, I know this may seem very dense, but this is leading somewhere very soon, don't worry. And they came up with what we call the verification principle, and that is we say that a sentence is factually significant to any given person, or meaningful, if and only if he knows how to verify the proposition which he purports to express via science, or through science. And for the longest time, the Vienna Circle, who, they also call themselves the logical positivist, they base much of their philosophy around this principle, okay? So they would literally reject any statement as meaningless if you could not provide scientific justification for it. So for example, God exists, okay? Now let's skip a few decades ahead to this gentleman here by the name of Anthony Flew. Now, Anthony Flew uh, was noted in the previous presentation uh, for having reverted to, or excuse me, converted to deism. However, he was considered to be one of the most influential philosopher, atheist philosophers at the time. And in 1972, he wrote a very interesting paper, okay, called The Presumption of Atheism. He was the one to first offer the distinction between negative and positive atheism. It is because of Anthony Flew that the concepts of negative and positive atheism came into existence. Okay, so he turned the traditional definition on its head and he said, no, there are two types of atheists. And I, myself, am a negative atheist. And from then on, that distinction became popular. But it didn't end there. More recently, a philosopher by the name of George Smith, in his book, Atheism, the Case Against God, which was written in 1979, he was also influenced by Anthony Flew's distinction, except he went a bit further. And he, I would claim, is, the, is now the father of new atheism. Although many of the new atheists will not cite him, they have read his work. Because if you notice the claims by Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, uh, the late Christopher Hitchens, and Daniel Dennett, this is the proposition that they follow. And he stated the following. The most significant variety of atheism is explicit atheism of philosophical nature. This atheism contends that the belief in God is irrational and should therefore be rejected faced with a lack of scientific evidence. This explicit atheist sees no reason whatsoever for believing in a supernatural being. As you can see, this is contemporary atheism in a nutshell. Okay. So I've given you a very concise genealogy. There's actually a lot more content in my paper. Um, but there is something missing on this, on this line here, this timeline. And that is the solution. And it actually comes between the Vienna Circle and Antony Flew, and was conveniently ignored by the latter. And what is that solution? Well, the solution was actually within Western philosophy itself. Because 
you know, not every philosopher agrees, obviously, that's why we're constantly arguing, that's like our job. And uh, two philosophers in particular came along and said, you know, this is all kind of nonsense, and let me explain why. Right. So first off, they were called the pragmatists, okay? The American School of Pragmatism, all right? And they decided to respond to logical positivism in the Vienna Circle, which was based in Europe. And this was kind of a, I guess you could say, for them it was more of a football match than anything. There was kind of like America versus the, you know, Europe. So this is the reason they kind of were motivated to do this to begin with. But they turned into a very significant debate. And the first problem they found, actually even Wittgenstein himself found this, which is quite ironic considering he thought he resolved all the issues of philosophy because he eventually came back and refuted himself, but that's a different discussion altogether. Um, they found something problematic with this statement. So what's the problem with this statement? For those of you who have been paying attention, you should note already what the problem with the statement is. It's the definition itself, because the statement itself cannot be scientifically verifiable. The statement itself lacks scientific content. It's self-refuting. And the pragmatist came along and said, hey, uh, your definition doesn't work, <laughs> because it refutes itself. So um, the logical positives were quite upset about this, um, and they did all they could to uh, salvage their philosophy that was just completely eliminated with a very short statement. Um, but the pragmatist came along and said, well, there's more problems with it as well, and it's your understanding of science. Okay, so introducing Willard Quine. Now, Willard Quine was an analytical philosopher of the pragmatist tradition, and he found a number of problems with that form of scientism in that the distinction between synthetic and analytic statements cannot be verified itself. Not just a statement, self-refuting, but the actual distinction between meaning and meaningless has no scientific basis. You, you can, okay, that's meaningless, that's meaningful. What scientific evidence do you have for that? So he said the distinction is superficial, number one. He then went on to say that meaning is holistic, not reductionist. You can't reduce meaning to statements, words, and phrases. What do you mean by that? Well, let me give you an example. It's a picture here of a lock, somebody locking their door. Now, let me give you a statement. Before I go to work today, I have to fix the lock on my door. Now, to all of you, that's a very meaningful statement, but why? Do you have to look at my lock? What do you have to verify in order to comprehend that? Let me explain. Why do I have to lock my door, number one? What does that mean? What does it mean to put a lock on my door? What sort of culture do I live in where locks are necessary? What's the value of the lock? Why do I have to do it before I go to work? Why am I going to work? Why do I work? Now, you're probably wondering, why am I asking all these questions? Well, the reason is because everything is connected. There is more to meaning. There's a context of meaning. There's a world of meaning that contributes to that statement. You understand it because you live in a context where that statement has meaning. It's not because you've reduced it to anything, to some, some axiom or some logical statement. It's because you live in a context where that makes sense. It's a web of knowledge. Okay, do I have much time? One minute? I'll stop it a little. <laughs> I don't know what I mean. I'm gonna go fast as I can here. Then came uh, Thomas Kuhn, who was also a contemporary of Quine, and he showed a very different understanding of science, which is actually um, uh, mainstream in philosophical circles today, however, not among the new atheists, which is quite interesting. And he showcased that science is not objective, it's not absolute, but it's paradigmatic. So what does that mean? Well, he was, first off, he was the one to coin the term paradigm, for those who are unaware, and he showcased that science is not something that is absolute because human beings are the ones that construct these theories, that construct these uh, ideas to understand the natural world. Okay, we'll get into that more later. Science is adaptive, not progressive. It changes based on new data. It does not progress. And he also proved that scientific revolutions are destructive, not enlightening. Let me give you one example. The geocentric and heliocentric system. Now, 
For those who haven't studied the differences between these theories, obviously the geocentric system stated that Earth was the center of the galaxy, whereas heliocentrism said the sun is. Now, why did we switch theories? Good question. Did Copernicus go into space on a rocket and observe the universe firsthand? No. In fact, what he did was that he looked at geocentric theory, he noticed that there were problems with it, and he said, let me see if I can come up with a simpler solution. So he sat at his desk with a little candle, and he literally thought about the easiest way to resolve certain issues with the geocentrism. He said, well, what if I put, and it had to do with ellipses, et cetera, what, do I, what if I put the sun in the middle? Then will these problems go away? And they did. And that's the reason we adopted the theory. <laughs> Not because we observed it, but because this one was easier to deal with. That's literally it. So that is an example of science being subjective, not objective in many respects, being adaptive, not progressive, and at the same time, um, what was I saying before? I'm trying to rush through this now, uh, sorry. Um, and just one, I have one more slide. So uh, pragmatically addressing the use. So you're probably also wondering, how does this tie into Islam? Well, in fact, there is a pragmatic tradition in Islam and I will leave that for Dr. Nazir Khan to discuss with Ibn Taymiyyah's epistemology. And we both concur that he was actually a pragmatist at heart. So inshallah, he will discuss that with you in his presentation. However, uh, because it's not the scope of this research, I will give you some pragmatic ways in which to address the youth uh, regarding their, uh, their appeals to, to scientism and atheism. So first off, doubt the doubts, not the doubter. Uh, because uh, if you truly want to get to the youth, you first need to doubt you can't doubt them and their uh, experiences, okay? Take those seriously and doubt their um, doubts instead. Play by your rules, not the doubts rules. Do not allow the doubt to be validated. What I mean by that, if somebody asks for scientific evidence of God, you do not say, oh, well, here it is. No, if it's an irrational doubt, do not make it rational. You have to say, no, that is irrational, because doubts can be irrational. Correct? Three, are their doubts consistent with the undoubtable? And we're almost done here. So for example, other things that we believe in as human beings, what makes us human? Let me give you some examples. Human rights, morality, beauty, love, reality itself. Does any of this have any scientific evidence whatsoever? The fact that humans have rights. There's no scientifically peer-reviewed paper that says that we have rights. There's no scientific peer review paper that says we have morality or that it's, that it's objective or subjective. There's nothing about beauty or love. They can reduce it to chemicals, but you don't want to tell that to your wife or husband. I love you because my serotonin is high today. You will die, <laughs> okay, right? Reality itself, can you prove that you're not in the matrix? Can you prove that you're actually in reality? The scientismist, the person who follows scientism, has to constantly prove their own existence and the content of the world around them. Is that a tree in front of me? Let me see if I can measure it. We cannot function as human beings based on these principles. You actually, it's actually dehumanizing to validate everything in by, this, by this measure. Right? And what are the alternatives? Okay, you want to be an atheist? Fine. Let's ask some questions. What are the alternatives? Now you believe human meaning and purpose are man-made. You hear this a lot. I'm sure you've heard a lot of atheists say this. Well, I make my own meaning and purpose, right? We hear that all the time. Well, that's fascinating. You've rejected religion be for being man-made and now you're believing in something that's man-made? Then why are you an atheist? Doesn't make any sense, right? How about name one atheistic civilization in history? You believe in evolution, survival, right? then why is it that evolution prefers theist over you? Why is that no human civilization has ever functioned by any sort of anti-supernatural standard? <clears throat> Excuse me. Why is it that every time we see an atheist civilization, they just slaughter each other and then they go away? Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot, they lasted for what, 10 years? Theists have been ruling the earth for how long? And why do you care about the future? Why do you care about the sick? Why do you care about the disabled? You have one life. Why do you care about spreading your genes? This is all a superficial, uh, what, alternative for what, the afterlife? It's just your fitra calling out to you in a materialistic way. 
You're just trying to replace it with something that's materialistic. It makes no sense to care about the sick and the disabled without an afterlife and without the concept of God. Why should I care about somebody in a wheelchair or somebody suffering from this disease? That's a waste of time and energy on my part and resources. I could be spending that all on myself. And I'm not going to live to see what happens to my kids, so why should I even care about having them? Right? We have to end. Sorry, so Jazakallah Khair, I apologize for going over my time. Thank you very much. Jazakallah Khair, and says Asallah for that very beautiful lecture. Uh, now we're going to take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back for a joint discussion. The questions that we were going to have for Ustaz Asadullah can be deferred to the upcoming discussion session uh, in 10 minutes, inshallah. So be back in 10 minutes.